to introduce the subject that I want to look at for the next couple of weeks together with you. I ask you to turn to John's Gospel, Chapter 1, initially, just for some introductory remarks. John's Gospel, Chapter Number 1. Look at verse number 35. Again, the next day after John stood in two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. Now, these are actually the first words of the Lord Jesus Christ in John's gospel. An interesting study, not something we're we'll going to look at tonight, but is to consider the, the first words of the Lord Jesus in each of the gospel accounts and how fitting they are in keeping with the theme of the gospel. But rather than that, I want you to think back with me in your mind, if you can, to Moses and the burning bush. Moses turned aside to see a burning bush. And when he turned aside, he had a revelation of God as the I am that I am. That's Exodus chapter 3. So when he turned aside to see, he learned God as the I am. Here are men that turn aside to see the Lord Jesus Christ. They are going to have revealed to them in the remainder of this gospel, the Lord Jesus as the great I am. We all know there are seven I am statements of the gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I think that's all seven. But to three of those seven, the Lord Jesus Christ adds an adjective. And he speaks about being the true light, about being the true bread, and about being the true vine. Now, we need to understand he's not speaking of himself as being true in contrast to false. He is true in the sense of being the ultimate to which everything else was pointing. He is the ultimate light. He is the ultimate bread. He is the ultimate vine. When you're thinking about the light, you're thinking about revelation. When you're thinking about the Lord Jesus as the true bread, you're thinking about relationship. You're thinking about reconciliation. Thinking about redemption, all of those thoughts crowd into the idea of the true bread. When you're thinking about the true vine, it's the reflection of the life of Christ in each one of us. So, as the true light, he gives us revelation. As the true bread, he brings us into a relationship of enjoyment and life. And as the true vine, he is able to reproduce his life in each one of us. As we bear fruit, the fruit of the vine is expressed in your life and in mine. So in the three weeks that we'll be together, we're going to be looking at the Lord Jesus tonight as the true light. Next week in the will of the Lord as the true bread. And finally, as the true vine. So we're going to ask you to turn back to John chapter one, where you are. And we'll read together in verse number. Maybe break into verse number four of John chapter one. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man coming into the world. Turn to John chapter 8, or at least you can just listen to me as I read these verses to you. They're very familiar, and you may not want to keep turning back and forth. But in John chapter 8, and verse number 12, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that 
follow with me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then just one other portion at the very end of your Bible, the book of the Revelation and chapter number 21. Revelation 21. And we'll break in at verse number 22. John is giving what he saw when he was up in heaven. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. So that'll be enough for us to read tonight. And we trust that God will add his blessing to the reading of these very familiar portions of the word of God. I want you to think about the preliminary light. I want you to think about the perfection of light. And then we'll look at the eternal light that God will provide. When I think about the preliminary light, isn't it significant that the very first thing that God introduced in his creation, God said, let there be light. God was indicating that nothing was possible apart from light. Light was life required light. Not only that, but if there was going to be warmth, if there was going to be growth, if there was going to be healing, if there was going to be comfort of any kind, light was mandatory. So the very first thing that God brought into being was light. As though God is underlining for everyone the absolute essential nature of light for life. Now, I would suggest to you that God introduced in the physical realm something that was meant to be a lesson in the spiritual realm. I'm not a physicist. Some of you may have had more physics than I had. and Mine is 50 years ago or more. But uh, men have difficulty describing what light is. There's something indefinable about light. Is it wave? Is it is it particle? What is it exactly? We know what it does. We we see by virtue of it. It reveals everything to us. But there's something that is almost indescribable about light. And the same thing relative to the Lord Jesus. But you notice we read here that in him was life and life was the light of men. Now, I used to read that and think that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came here and displayed his life, that that was what was in view here. But really, what the Spirit of God is saying is that the existence of life should have been a testimony to everyone that there was a life giver. That he is the life giver, that everything that possesses life possesses it because of him. And the light shined in darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Men did not appreciate. Men turned to idolatry rather than turning to the light that God gave. And then God graciously, when men failed the natural light, God graciously gave light through his word. Not just the light of creation, but the light of inspiration. And when men failed to appreciate that, God gave another light. He gave John the Baptist. He came to bear witness to the light, God graciously condescending to man's failure and man's inability to comprehend until finally we read here in verse number nine that the true light came. Everything else was preliminary. Everything else was pointing to this. Everything else was leading up to the coming of the true light into the world. And so we're reminded here of the Light that has come, the ultimate. Now, I want you to think of what that means. If he is the ultimate light, if he is the true light, that means God has no light outside of Christ. God has nothing more to offer humanity. He has nothing more to offer you and me than Christ. We're going to be seeing that Christ is everything in, in God's recipe book. When it comes to light and life, Christ is everything. God has no other light to provide this world than his son. And he has no other light to provide us with than the Lord Jesus Christ as well. 
So we have it in its preliminary form. But then he was the true light. So now we have light in all its perfection. I want you to think of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Light entered our dark world. Remember what the father of John the Baptist, Zacharias, said when the Lord Jesus, in his hymn of praise in Luke chapter 1, could speak of the light that had come to shine darkness recall what simeon said as he took the lord jesus christ up in his arms in luke chapter 2 a light to lighten the gentiles and the glory of thy people israel when the lord jesus christ came god was shedding light into a dark world but i want you to think as well not just of his incarnation and his coming i want you to think of the life that he lived it's very interesting that whenever the spirit of god wants to impress us with a particular virtue, he almost always takes us to Christ. When it comes to giving and sacrifice, he reminds us of the one who was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. But he wants us to think about others. He tells us of the Lord Jesus Christ who please not himself in Romans chapter 15. When he wants to tell us about selfless service, he reminds us of the servant of Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. When he talks about relationships among believers in Colossians chapter 3, speaks about for, forbearing and forgiving, even as Christ forgave us. And so wherever you turn, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ becomes the standard. In his life, there is light that tells us how we ought to live our lives. The attributes of light. The abundance of that light, the availability of it for us to, to appreciate. And so as we come to the word of God and look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we learn how we ought to live. His life brings light to us. Now we're all faced with circumstances that are very inconvenient at the, at the least and very, very burdensome to some at the most, affecting health, affecting employment affecting economics affecting lifestyle affecting travel separating families all of these things how did the lord jesus christ respond to negative circumstances let me take you to a chapter that you're very familiar with and a chapter that is often used in the gospel you recall how matthew chapter 11 ends with that wonderful invitation come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Where do, where do those verses occur in Matthew? The chapter begins with John the Baptist questioning, are you the Messiah or do we look for another? It goes on from there to speak about the cities who had rejected his testimony, despite the miracles that were done. He speaks about the people who we're not satisfied with John the Baptist ministry and said that uh, they criticized John. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came eating and drinking, they accused him of being a drunkard and they were not satisfied. There was always something they could find. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, I thank you, Father, who haven't revealed these things to the wise and prudent. Revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seems good in your sight. The Lord Jesus was thanking his father. For what we would call a very, very small success linked with his ministry. Very few people. If you think of it, the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest preacher that ever preached, the most consistent light that was ever lived, the most godly example ever given. When he left earth, there were probably a little over 500 converts that he could count. There are some people in our world today that get that many people in one day with a mass meeting and a mass appeal. Was it a very successful, outwardly, outwardly successful ministry of the Lord Jesus? Yet he was thankful that the Father had so ordered things that these were the circumstances of his life. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. That willingness to submit to whatever circumstances God brings into our lives. Now, having gray hair, and I do need a haircut, so forgive me for the way I look. 
Uh, if any of you are good at cutting hair over the internet, let me know. And uh, maybe someone could post a video on how to self-cut your hair and uh, it will be helpful. But be that as it may, uh, having gray hairs, you have uh, the weight of experience. And so one thing I have learned is this, that God will never bring circumstances into your life or mine that are calculated to hinder us in our spiritual lives. Every circumstance can be turned to spiritual profit. You may say, well, what can we do when we're confined? We can't leave our homes unless some of you have liberty to go to work, but many of you don't. We're confined to our homes. We're limited. I was thinking of the Apostle Paul. Perhaps for eight years of his service for Christ, he was chained to two Roman soldiers. He was confined and could not move about freely. Now, of course, he could have people come. He had a bit more liberty than we have right now. But I would venture to say there probably were no more fruitful eight years in all of the history of Christianity than the eight years that Paul spent confined and chained to Roman soldiers. He found a way of furthering the work of God, whether through letter writing, or contact with others. And certainly we have available to us far more in the way of avenues of communication than the Apostle Paul had. But his confinement was a very fruitful time. Ours can be as well as we look for ways of reaching out, whether to other believers, whether to those in need, whether to the unsaved, whether to family members, whatever it may be, ways of becoming fruitful even amidst the circumstances. The Lord Jesus Christ never lived under circumstances. He always used whatever circumstances came, his, came into his life for the furtherance of others. I think one of the classic examples, one of the most humbling examples to me is when he was weary, he sat by a well. We would have thought, I'm tired, I need to rest, and I need time for myself. He sat by a well sent disciples away so he could be alone with a Samaritan woman with no interruptions so that he could see her brought to the Father. So we are reminded here that he is the example for our lives in every way. In his light, we learn how we ought to live and how we ought to respond to everything that occurs into our lives. Lord Jesus, as the perfection of light, the ultimate light that God has for all of us. And the wonderful thing is, it is available. We come to the word of God and the light of God's word, as we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, as we learn of him, the light of his word shines upon our pathway and gives us light. But I want you to come with me now and you're thinking to Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And I want you to think about perpetual eternal light. We read together there that in that temple, there is no need of light. For the Lord, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb light in it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. First of all, I want you to think of the, um, the unusual symbol of the kingdom. Now, as I look around, I see at least. Quickly, just gauging things, about five nationalities, there's probably more exhibited on the screen in front of me. Even, even have the UK. And uh, you think about the animals that different nations take as their symbol. There is the Chinese dragon. There's the American eagle. There's the British bulldog. Uh, the Russian bear. Uh, kingdoms, nations take animals which have some measure of aggressiveness, some measure of ferocity, some measure of uh, uh, danger connected with dealing with them. The symbol that heaven has taken for its emblem is a lamb. Now, it's interesting because there was a bullock, there were rams, there were goats, there were lambs, turtle doves, pigeons, yet God chose a lamb to represent the kingdom of heaven. 
There is something about the lamb-like character of the Lord Jesus that has revealed, has embodied everything that God ever wanted to reveal to men. I think it is the words of David Gooding, Professor David Gooding, who said, the cross of Christ says it all. Never to all eternity will anyone ever discover anything about the heart and character of God that was not revealed at the cross. God has revealed himself fully. And for all eternity, God is going to give light to a lamb. In other words, everything that God wants us to know of himself is going to be revealed in a lamb-like character of Christ. It is incredible to think of the singular glory of the kingdom is going to be all revealed to us. The light of eternity will be seen in a lamb that God has constituted as the light of heaven. It is the exclusive, the exclusive display of God's glory. All of God's glory. We read there in Revelation. Let me turn to it again as I want to quote it precisely in Revelation 21. We read there that the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. All of God's glory will, will be displayed in this one, in the light of the one who was Lamb-like in his character here upon earth. It will be the exclusive display of God's glory. No other place, no other avenue for displaying his glory other than this Lamb. He will be the exclusive. He will be the exhaustive display. All of God's glory will be seen in the light that emanates from the Lord Jesus. In the light of Christ. He is the full exhaustive. He is the full exclusive display of God's light. But then we're reminded that there will never be a night there. Now, I know that that's literal, but I think as well, there is the thought. There will never be a diminishing of the glory of God that is seen in Christ. The opposite will be expansive. As we grow eternally, we will appreciate more and more of the greatness of God as seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you, I know you don't read it yourselves, but you've probably read to your children the Chronicles of Narnia. It's beyond all of you adults reading books such as that. But you recall in one of the stories near the end, Lucy says to Aslan, Aslan, you've grown. And he says, no, my dear, you've grown. And the more you grow, the bigger I will appear. And as we grow eternally, because we will grow eternally in our appreciation, in our capacity, the more we grow eternally, the more we will appreciate the light that the Lord Jesus Christ sheds as to the very character and being of our God. He is the exclusive display, nowhere else. The exhaustive display, all in him. The eternal display, never ending. And an enlarging display of light and appreciation of the character of God. That's why he could say that he was the true light. Lighting every man as a result of his coming into the world. Had he not come, there would have been absolute, total darkness. Just as darkness brooded over the, the face of the earth back in Genesis 1 and 1, until God said, let there be light. Had he not come, we would have lived and we would have died in absolute darkness. Thank God for the true light that has come, that has lighted every man by reason of his coming into the world. Now, were we to expand on this, there's a very practical aspect, and I'll just leave it with you and not really expand on it at all. In Ephesians, we are reminded not just that we are in the light, but Ephesians 5 says that we are light in the Lord. We are to walk as children of light. So as he revealed all that God is, we have the responsibility in our lives to reveal all that he is by our life and by our walk. 
So we trust God will bless his word and encourage us and enable us to find in Christ all that we need for light as we walk in a very, very dark 